Thanks, Rahul. Uh, okay, so we have a interventionist talking about diagnosis and medical management. I love that. All right, here are my disclosures again. Okay, so I think we've seen some of this data already. We're dealing with a very significant problem and just kind of the cut to the chase. PE is the third most common cause of cardiovascular death. And you can see 10% uh, are fatal within the first hour, and this is a very significant problem. When we talk about recurrent VTE in patients who have PE, it's usually in the form of PE. And so this explains a two to three fold higher mortality. And uh, anywhere between 15 and 20% of patients with a PE will die within a year of diagnosis. And a lot of that is due to their medical comorbidities. And I think you also saw this slide before, so I'm not going to spend too much time in it, but suffice it to say, it is a very significant cause of death in this country, even more than some of the things that get a lot of press. Uh, this is taken from a study that was done in uh, Olmsted uh, County, Minnesota, and it basically shows that the incidence of VTE is persistent, so it's not changing. Here, uh, from a study in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, we see the incidence of VTE is increasing. Uh, we know that PE accounts for a lot of surgical-related deaths, and you could see a one-year case fatality rate following major surgery in about a third of patients. And I, I like this slide because besides mortality, which we spend a lot of time talking about, those of you who may be involved in hospital administration are very concerned about readmission. And despite changes in what we've done and all the aggressive treatment of PE, there's still a, a, a readmission rate of at least 15% in this patient population. And again, that's because of a lot of the comorbidities. So we're gonna talk about why is this and what happens. Well. Again, the interventionalist perspective, the RV is very important in the pathophysiology of PE, and how much the uh, you know, RV is affected will dictate what happens with the patient. When we divide patients, we can divide them into really these three categories, and really I think it's getting a lot of press with a lot of our treatments lately because before it was you know people who are dying, so massive, and then everybody else. But I think we've learned over the last many years about the importance of the group of submassive pulmonary embolism or those patients who have RV dysfunction or um, with who are normotensive or stable, and we're gonna talk about that a little more. Here are the European guidelines from their cardiology society divided the patients and they took that submassive group and they call it intermediate and they uh, basically separated into intermediate high risk and intermediate low risk depending on um, whether or not they had signs of RV dysfunction on both biomarkers and uh, imaging or one or the other. We also see that when you have an increased RV to LV ratio, you have a very significant increase in PE-related mortality. And these were CT scan studies, and it showed the importance of RV in dysfunction and mortality. Here we're seeing, uh, again, mortality. If you have RV dysfunction and troponin elevation, you're going to have a higher incidence of either PE-related death or all-cause mortality. And it isn't just death that we're talking about. The more uh, patients who have RV dysfunction on imaging, this taken from uh, the Italian PE registry, and troponin elevation will have a significantly higher, almost a 17-fold increase in uh, deterioration requiring escalation of therapy. Here this shows you what's the importance of having a DVT. So a lot of people say, well, we've made the diagnosis of PE, but how important is DVT? And you'll see here that with DVT in these patients, you have a higher incidence of death. And this was taken from a large meta-analysis that was done. Uh, again, this uh, chart that you've seen before, separating from the heart guidelines of uh, massive, submassive, and low risk or minor. But we know that this massive population, and I think you're going to hear a little bit more in a, in a bit, is a very heterogeneous population. You'll have those patients who have massive PE who are truly crashing and dying, and then those who are actually closer to, let's call it a stable massive. And they qualify based on, say, uh, hypotension and uh, the need for vasopressor support. As far as submassive pulmonary embolism taken from the AHA guidelines, really there's things that are not in the definition that we may use to help further substratify these patients. So, for example, heart rate isn't included in there, the amount of clot, whether or not you have leg uh, DVT or hypoxemia. Uh, 
Many people use the PESI score, or even more commonly now the simplified PESI score, the S-PESI score, to help further stratify these patients. And here, this is um, a, a paper that was published that looked at taking all of these measurements and looking at a, compositive, a composite uh, index to, inc to um, look at the 30-day complication course. And basically, with combining uh, DVT, the PESI score greater than zero, BNP and troponin, if you had a combination of these four, you had a five-fold increase in adverse 30-day outcome. And here, this is just a simple algorithm that the Europeans have in their guidelines for how you're going to treat the patients. So part of treating the patients is actually making the diagnosis. And to make the diagnosis, you have to understand, you have to think of the diagnosis of PE. And you could see here a whole host of uh, symptoms that we see with a lot of these patients, which are interpreted as other causes to these symptoms, but actually may indicate that the patient has a PE. So, you know, a lot of patients who, you know, are hypotensive in the ICU, the first diagnosis, especially in 2018, people think about is sepsis, but actually you need to think about PE. And there's a variety of imaging tests that are done, uh, and, and all of these have their specific findings. I think a VQ scan is something that was done certainly much more in prior decades, but now most patients are just getting the CT angiogram. It's quick way to have diagnostic tool. In addition, it can give you an idea of RV function in terms of, or at least RV dysfunction in terms of the RV-LV ratio. So current approaches to PE treatment, you know, we have further talks that are going to be in this session, which are going to talk about a lot of the catheter and surgical. Uh, I'm going to basically cover anticoagulation and fibrinolysis. When we're trying to come up with decision making for PE patients, you know, and you'll hear a little bit more today about pulmonary embolism response teams, but even if you don't have something called a PERT or pulmonary embolism response team, it's important to have a consistent triage process in dealing with pulmonary embolism. And usually that's reserved for the submassive and massive cases, because most of the time when these patients with low risk PE come into the ED, you don't even hear about it. As far as guidelines, there is certainly level one evidence. It's very strong in both the chest and uh, American heart guidelines to give anticoagulation. This has been shown to work, and so you're going to give it right away. As far as the timing of treatment, guidelines basically said, don't wait while you're waiting for tests. If you think the patient has a PE, clinical suspicion is high, give it. Um, what about the mortality in the low risk group? Uh, there's basically a 1.1% risk of a 30-day mortality in the very low risk group. So those patients you're going to treat with basically just anticoagulation. Further guidelines basically said that um, most of the patients are going to be treated for three months with anticoagulation. In patients who do not have cancer, you're going to think about using NOACs over vitamin K like uh, agonists like uh, warfarin. In patients with cancer, you're going to now think about using low molecular weight heparin over uh, VKAs or NOACs. And you can see, though, those are grade 2B and 2C recommendations, respectively. Uh, what about uh, the small subsegmental PEs, which we do find on imaging? And basically, the guidelines go on to say that if you have these small subsegmental PEs and no proximal DVT, and there's basically a very low incidence for recurrent P uh, VTE, they suggest surveillance over treatment. Now, with anticoagulation, there's definitely been evolution in what people are doing, whether you're going to bridge people or switch people from parenteral to NOACs or oral monotherapy. And I think there's a lot more use of the oral uh, uh, NOACs nowadays. Oh. And now, as far as um, here's uh, taken from a meta-analysis, basically showing that the NOACs were not inferior to the vitamin K agonists pretty much for recurrent PE, fatal PE, and overall mortality. And here, the safety, you can see slants in the uh, favor of the NOACs as well. Um, as far as further substratification, I mentioned that before, you can use certainly the clinical, biomarkers, and imaging to help further substratify these patients. And why stratify? Because that's going to help you figure out what kind of treatment you're going to want to do. And we talked about that a little bit before. Why do advanced therapy? Because obviously you want to prevent mortality. You want to treat hemodynamic collapse. You want to treat the symptoms, potentially prevent the POE's PE syndrome, improve quality of life, and also pre possibly prevent uh, CTEF. Um, Okay, so 
quickly on systemic thrombolysis. Basically, in all of the trials, either for massive or submassive pulmonary embolism, you will see better outcomes and less mortality with fibrinolysis. However, this is at a risk for increased bleeding. Nonetheless, fibrinolysis is covered in the guidelines and basically you're going to use it in specific patients as listed here. So, in summary, risk stratification is critical to identify acute PE patients who would benefit from advanced therapy. The selection of the advanced therapy and anticoagulation uh, strategies are going to depend on the assessment of patients' risks of adverse outcomes and major bleeding. Uh, determining the appropriate anticoagulation regimen should consider the risk of recurrence, risk of bleeding, as well as patient preference, and the multidisciplinary PE response teams, which you're going to hear about more in the, fu in the future talks, are going to have the potential to help standardize therapy and improve access to advanced therapies. Thank you.